Good afternoon. Yeah. The meeting of the Ways and Means Committee will come to order. The clerk will note the roll, and I am pleased to say that we have a quorum. I was wondering about that for a little bit, but uh, we do. So uh, it's good to see everyone. It's been six months since we had a Ways and Means meeting. A uh, long time in uh, the political world. But, uh, but anyway, I'm pleased to have everyone back, and I felt that uh, for my last meeting, I certainly should buy some treats. So uh, <laughs> please uh, help yourself to uh, either the healthy or the non-healthy selections that are oh, yeah. before you. Um, and with that, uh, we have our, um, our uh, finance commissioner and budget director and state economist uh, here before us. Uh, welcome back to the Ways and Means Committee. Who would like to start? Uh, Mr. Chair, oh, good, good afternoon. Thank you for having us back today. As you mentioned, uh, on my right, I have uh, Britta Raitan, the state budget director, and on my left is Dr. Laura Columbakidis, the state economist. So we would like to go through the slide deck that we used on forecast day last Thursday. So that's up on the screen, and you should have copies of that as well. So let me jump right in. Thank you for the treats today, and Mr. Chair, appreciate the, that uh, uh, gesture. So let's start with the uh, state finances are stable. So we're going to explain today what has changed since our February forecast. As always, that is our benchmark from where we're moving from, is what, what did we uh, forecast last February and what are we forecasting today? As you know, we've projected a balance now of $1.5 billion for fiscal years 2020 and 2021. I'm going to call them 20 and 21. I, there's too many 20s in there to say 20 all the time, but if you get confused, just raise your hand and I'll clarify. So one of the other, the other good news that I'll mention in just a minute is, is the idea that we've got the budget reserve uh, now is over $2 billion, and I'll give you those numbers in just a minute. But for uh, Dr. Klumbakidis will describe how the economic out outlook has weakened for the long term since last February with slower revenue growth projected. And Budget Director Eitan will describe the reduced spending growth in both the next biennium, 2020, 2020, and also the biennium after that, 22 and 23. As always, there are risks with this forecast, and we will explain those risks as we, as we go through. So if you look at this first slide, I wanted to start off with the budget reserve. Obviously, a cornerstone of budget stability is an adequate reserve in the event of an economic downturn. And we've all been through this, or most of us have been through this together. We learned it the hard way. And after the Great Recession, where we virtually had no reserve and a $6 billion deficit, now we've been able to restore the, the uh, budget reserve. And one of our proudest achievements is restoring the, budget, the strong budget reserve. And one of the things we want to make sure we do is provide context for this for the next administration and for the next administration. So as you can tell from the slide, there are two components to our reserves. We have the budget reserve account, the budget reserve, uh, and you can see on the 2019, the balance was 1.583, if you can read that number. And then the cash account was $350 million. That's at the bottom of that chart. So you can tell from the... Uh, the budget reserve account that the total reserves are what some people call rainy day funds with the addition of $491 million uh, as of the, f the November forecast, the total budget reserve is $2,075,000,000 or $2,075,000,000. The total of rainy day forecast, uh, the total rainy day fund is now up to almost $2.5 billion. We are within $175 million of <clears throat> filling the budget reserve and most of you will recall that the statutory reserve target is 5% of non-dedicated general funds, or in this case, the target is $2.25 billion. I'll turn it over to Budget Director Ritan to describe the budget outlook and show how these reserve calculations affect our budget outlook. Mr. Chair, I'm Britta Rayton, State Budget Director. Uh, the next slide shows the change in the bu budgetary balance for fiscal years 18 and 19. As you can see in the lower right corner, the overall budgetary balance has increased by 432 million since the end of session estimates. And this is after the allocation of additional funding to the budget reserve. Since the end of session, revenue estimates have increased by 609 million and expenditure estimates have declined by 306 million. We'll talk more about the drivers of those changes a little bit later in the presentation. Even before the statutory allocation of 33% of the balance to the reserve, 
The reserve balance increased by 137 million due to two additional statutory allocations. So you can see the 137 million on the budget cash and budget reserve lines of the chart. Um, the first of which was 90 million dollars in remaining funds from the health care premium subsidy program that canceled to the reserve at the end of 18. And second is 47 million of excess surplus from the workers comp assigned risk plan that was also deposited into the reserve. Moving to the next line, the stadium reserve declined by 8 million relative to our previous forecast. And this reduction is due to a decision that given the size of the stadium reserve, it's no longer necessary to deposit the $20 million a year in corporate franchise tax revenue into the reserve. If you recall, this was a supplemental revenue source for the reserve and now that $20 million per year falls to the bottom, of, bottom line of the general fund. These changes leave us with an estimated balance of 1.074 billion. 33% of that, which is 354 million, is allocated to the reserve. So that 354 million that's allocated uh, with that with that uh, statutory allocation plus the 137 million from the line above brings the total reserve change to the 491 million that Commissioner Franz mentioned previously. This leaves 720 million available to balance forward into the next biennium. So moving to the next slide. This provides a, the budgetary picture for fiscal years 20 and 21. This is where you can see the 1.544 billion that is projected to be available in the upcoming biennium. A combination of increased revenues and decreased expenditures as well as an increase in the balance that is rolling forward from the current biennium drives the increase in this estimated available balance when we compare it to end of session estimates. Revenues have increased by 190 million and expenditures have declined by 489 million relative to our previous estimates. On this chart, you can once again see the 491 million increase in the reserve balance. And the stadium reserve balance is again reduced, this time by 22 million from previous estimates. Uh, but it is still growing year over year. And this is again due to the removal of the corporate franchise tax. Uh, we'll provide further detail on the drivers of the expenditure and revenue changes later in the presentation. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Columbakitis to talk about the economy and the revenue forecast changes. Columbakitis, welcome back to the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Laura Columbakitis, the state economist. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about the outlook for the U.S. economy and how that has changed since we last prepared a forecast um, in February. <clears throat> I will then move to the Minnesota economy and finally to the changes in our revenue forecast. The first chart, the one that says U.S. outlook weakened since February, the first chart compares the current U.S. real GDP forecast by Minnesota's macroeconomic consulting firm IHS to their prior forecast. So in this chart, the dark bars show the history, so from the recession through, uh, through the current period, um, and the dark bars continue on to show the November outlook by IHS. And then the light bars show their February outlook. So if you focus on years 2017 through 2023, so on the right end of the chart, you can see that the outlook for U.S. economic growth, especially after next year, has weakened since Minnesota's forecast was last prepared in February. Strong growth in the second and third quarters of 2018 has led IHS to increase their expectations for this year's real GDP growth from 2.7% in February's outlook to 2.9% in November. Uh, they maintained their forecast for growth in uh, 2019 and uh, 2020, but their outlook for 2021 through 23 is weaker than in February. And if you look at the current forecast for 18 to 23, so if you look just at the dark bars on the right, uh, right end of the chart, you can see a slowdown in economic growth through our forecast horizon. So GDP, real GDP is still growing throughout our forecast horizon, um, but it is growing at a slowing rate. While current conditions can support moderate growth this year and next, IHS expects the economy to begin slowing in late 2019. This occurs as the fiscal stimulus from the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act fades, monetary policy becomes more restrictive, global growth weakens, 
and a strong U.S. dollar relative to our trading partners' currencies pulls down net exports. After mid-2020, a decline in the labor force participation rate due to an aging U.S. workforce is expected to slow the economy even more. The downshift continues with annual real GDP growth expected to decelerate from 2.9 percent annually in 2018 to less than half that rate in 2023. The history on this chart, the years since the recession of 08-09, illustrates one of the risks to this forecast. The dotted line shows the average annual real GDP growth during the 20 years prior to the recession, which was 3.1 percent, and that's much higher than what is in our current <coughs> forecast. It's higher than what we have experienced since the recession as well. And when the economy is growing slowly, there's not much margin for error. It's harder to recover from a setback than when growth is higher. And the U.S. expansion is now the second longest on record. A mature, low growth expansion is particularly vulnerable when negative shocks occur. The next chart compares Minnesota's labor market performance to the nation's. This chart shows the headline unemployment rate. Uh, the dark line is for Minnesota. The light line is for the United States. The vertical gray bars show the U.S. recessions, so the white space between the gray bars is the are the recovery and expansion periods. With the U.S. expansion in its 10th year, Minnesota's steady economic performance and tight labor market continue. Even as available workers are becoming scarce, the state's steady job growth has kept the unemployment rate low. Minnesota's unemployment rate currently stands between the low points of the prior two expansions at 2.8 percent. It's nearly one percentage point below the U.S. rate, half a percentage point below last year, the fifth lowest among states and the lowest we've seen in 18 years. The next chart further illustrates Minnesota's tight labor market. The gray bars, the height of the gray bars shows the total number of unemployed workers, so unemployed job seekers statewide, and the dark bars show the number of job vacancies. In the height of the gray bars, you can see the peak of unemployment during the recession, so that gray bar hill in the middle there. And then you can see how Minnesota's steady job growth during the recovery and expansion have gradually whittled that number down. The dark bars show that job vacancies statewide have grown to a very high level. The ratio of unemployed persons to job vacancies statewide has been less than one for over the past year. And while it was less than one in 16 and 17, I was saying we had a tight labor market. Um, but now it's down to about 0 0.7. Actually, when it was uh, around one or above one, I was saying it was a tight labor market. Now it's less than one and even down to 0 0.7. That means there are fewer unemployed job seekers than open positions across the state. And that tight labor market is being felt across Minnesota. For the first time in this data series, both the Twin Cities and Greater Minnesota have fewer unemployed persons per job vacancy. The number of open positions illustrates a strong demand for Minnesota workers and certainly not an unwillingness of Minnesotans to work. In fact, the data show Minnesotans to be very hardworking. The overall labor force participation rate is well above the national level and is the highest among U.S. states. And the flip side of our low unemployment rate is a very high share of the over 16 population that is working, also well above the U.S. and the highest among U.S. states. Excuse me, Dr. Kolumbakitis. I've got a question. Representative Hurthaus. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Doctor, you mentioned that you thought that the uh, benefits of the TCGA was going to fade. Uh, what provisions of that uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act do you think are going to be contributing to the decline in uh, the growth of the economy? Uh, Dr. Kolumbakitis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members, members of the committee. Uh, so we have... Um, some of it, some of it is yet to be seen. So, for instance, the um, the individual income tax cuts, people might have, might have may not have seen all of that yet, and so they'll see some of that in um, their April fifteenth tax returns. Um, but and so that's why we still have some increased growth in eighteen and nineteen. Um, but after that, the um, the there's that those provisions will uh, will not be continuing to contribute extra consumer spending, and then um, you have some provisions within business uh, investment uh, that also have a, had a temporary boost, and those will also be fading. Dr. Columbus Kiedis, when you say they'll be fading, I mean, people will still have the tax cut. I guess, why do you say they'll be fading? 
because the excuse me, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. So uh, what IHS expects is that uh, that the boost to spending was uh, was temporary as a result of getting that getting initially getting that tax cut. And while consumer spending will remain the driver of um, of U.S. growth, uh, it's expected not to be as strong as what had been previous previously. Representative Hertoffs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I guess if consumers still have more discretionary money in their pocket, um, you're saying that even though they have this money, it's not going to drive the economy. Um, I'm just knowing that historically we have a very low savings rate in this nation, so mm -hmm. people tend to spend what they have. Mm -hmm. So I, it seems like a little bit of a contradiction. Uh, Representative Houseman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up, um, I was under the impression that the that the individual tax cut goes away, that, that the corporate and business tax cut continues, but the but the individual goes away. Dr. Columbicutis. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, that's true. The the individual income tax cuts um, are temporary. They do eventually go to away. Go away. They go away. I believe in 2025, though. And that's what, why it would fade. That's that's one of the reasons that it eventually fades. Well, yeah, Dr. Columbia said it would eventually fade then in 2025 or 2027. I want to say it was 10 years. Uh, so I guess from that standpoint, it would be eventually fading, but that's way beyond the forecast that we've got here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, so some of the other things that are leading to lower growth going forward are the tightening of monetary policy. So that's continuing. That's been expected to to happen, and that that's continuing. We have lower um, global growth in the forecast than what we had in the prior forecast, and there are signs now, um, even since this outlook was produced, of uh, global growth slowing. Um, there, uh, the. The factor that has bubbled back up in this forecast that we saw a couple of years ago is the strong U.S. dollar. And so as the U.S. economy continues to grow and other economies slow down, that means that um, the U.S. looks like a better place to, uh, to put investment. And so in order to invest in the United States, uh, investors need U.S. dollars, so the demand for U.S. dollars goes up. When the dollar ha is strong, that reduces demand for uh, U.S. exports. And so one of the things that's happening as we move out into the planning horizon is that um, net exports become a larger drag um, on the U.S. economy. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, a double-edged sword. So when the U.S. is growing faster than other nations, that ends up um, causing this export drag. And uh, Dr. Kalamakitis, I would say that, yes, I think that there are some signs that the economy is, at least at the moment, uh, slow. And I have two other questions, if I could. First, when you go back to the um, unemployment chart that you have up there, has there ever been a situation <clears throat> in Minnesota history that we've got records of where we had more uh, where we had a situation like this, where there were, you know, more job vacancies than people to fill them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I don't, this, this series is not very old. And so um, I don't know how much further back it goes than what I have right here. Actually, I think it goes to 2000. And so this situation with the, um, the ratio of unemployed job seekers to job vacancies being less than one, that's, uh, that's the first time in this series, but I can't speak for prior to, say, 2000, when they weren't collecting these data. Okay. And then I guess the other question I was going to ask, which goes back maybe a chart or two, is you talk about, you know, the slowing economy and you'll get into less money in the out years, or maybe the commissioner will. Uh, the stock market is down a bit from where it was when they made these projections mm -hmm. and what IHS projected it would be. And income taxes now comprise over 50% of our general fund revenues, and capital gains are an important part of that. Do you have any sense for, I mean, if there's a 20% you know, drop in the stock market, does that translate into a 1% you know, drop in our income tax revenues? Or is there any sort of a correlation there that you know of? 
Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, you're right that um, capital gains are vo volatile and that they're an important source of income tax revenue. And so as the, as capital gains moves, so can the income tax move. I, at the moment, I don't have... Um, I don't have a number to give you for you know the elasticity of the percentage change in the stock market or percentage change in capital gains and how that translates into the income tax. Um, I think I can get that for you, but I don't have it right now. So it wouldn't be movement in the stock market. It would be movement in capital gains realizations and how that affects income tax revenues. Um, another thing to keep in mind with regard to uh, capital gains realizations, which is what people take uh, pay. Um, tax on, income tax on, is that yes, it is financial assets in your portfolio of stocks and, and other financial assets, but we also get capital gains um, realizations from people selling businesses. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, while when we forecast capital gains, we are looking at what's happening in the stock market, but we're also, we also know that some company companies that have been built in Minnesota and then they get sold, they you know that can cause uh, cause one time events um, in capital gains as well. So that's just another source of uncertainty or volatility in that area. Uh, well, thank you, Doctor. I guess I would say I I'm not anticipating being at the next meeting myself, but uh, I think that that would be uh, inf interesting information. And if I can be so forward as to uh, ask you to uh, bring that capital gains information and provide it to the uh, people who are here at the next meeting. I think at least some of them would find it interesting. Sure. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, so I'm going to move to the revenue forecast. Total general fund revenues for the current biennium are now forecast to be $609 million more than the February forecast. Higher expected individual income, corporate, and other tax revenues more than offsets a reduced forecast for sales tax revenue. In addition to the changes in the near-term economic outlook, this forecast reflects new estimates of the revenue impacts from taxpayer responses to the federal tax law changes, <clears throat> as well as additional sales tax revenue expected to arise from a recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling regarding state taxation of remote sales. The largest dollar amount change in the current biennium revenue forecast is in the individual income tax, which is forecast to generate $419 million more in FY18-19 than we had estimated in February. Due to higher than expected income tax revenues at the close of FY18 and slightly for, uh, higher forecast income growth this calendar year, <coughs> um, that was those were the reasons for the, um, the income tax forecast being higher. Sorry. I, the, these positive changes offset a revenue forecast reduction due to expected taxpayer responses to the federal tax law change, as well as individuals choosing, such as individuals choosing to itemize deductions on their Minnesota returns, even though they take the standard deduction for federal tax purposes. Sales tax revenue in the current um, biennium is now forecast to be $120 million less than the February forecast. This change is due to lower than expected gross sales tax receipts so far in FY18-19, slightly lower projected growth in spending on taxable goods and services, and higher forecast sales tax refunds in fiscal year 19. We also added to sales tax revenue for the impact of the U.S. Supreme Court decision in South Dakota versus Wayfair, which allows states to require remote sellers to collect and remit sales or use tax on sales to customers within the state. The revenue addition was not large enough to offset the negative changes that I've already mentioned. The forecast change for the next biennium, so on the, the right-hand side of the table here, um, higher, the forecast change for the next biennium shows a similar pattern. Higher forecast individual income, corporate, and other tax revenues offset a slightly lower sales tax forecast to raise the revenue forecast for 2020 and 21 by $190 million. And the dynamics are similar in this biennium too. Faster growing individual income, especially non-wage income in this case, offsets a revenue reduction from taxpayer decisions and, addition to, and in addition to forecast sales tax revenues for taxation of remote sales is not quite large enough to completely offset a lower base of sales tax receipts and a higher refund forecast. So if you'll recall the deceleration in economic growth over our planning horizon, note that 
um, growth in total revenues is also declining over the three biennia including in, included in this forecast. Revenues are still growing across these years. As long as the bars are above zero, that's still growing, but the pace of growth is slowing. It was similar to what I said about the real GDP growth. On the chart, we illustrate that between the last biennium and the current one, total revenues grow three point, grew 3.4 percent per year. The rate falls to 3.2 percent between the current biennium and the next, and falls again to 2.5 percent between FY 20 and 21, and then 22 and 23. And Budget Director Rayton will talk about the impact of the revenue slowdown on the state's structural balance. So let me conclude by drawing your attention to some of the risks in the forecast. This forecast assumes that all of the U.S. tariffs and other countries' retaliatory measures that were in place or scheduled in early November are permanent. But as you know, U.S. trade policy, especially regarding China and the new NAFTA agreement, has been in flux. Prolonged uncertainty imposes costs on businesses that have to address supply chain disruptions and they may put investment on hold, plans on hold. So a pro prolonged uncertainty could end up slowing the economy um, based on the slowdown in uh, a potential slowdown in business investment. We just talked about the stock market, but the stock market's solid gains of earlier this year were disrupted by volatility in recent months. In this forecast, IHS expects the stock market to remain volatile, but with continued appreciation in equity values. If the recent stock market decline worsens, or if the market generally just underperforms what um, IH, IHS expects, the resulting erosion of household wealth could cause consumer spending to grow more slowly than IHS's forecast. And of course, the converse is also true. If the market outperforms um, expectations, then um, growth could be higher. The Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 made some big changes to federal tax law, and individuals and business owners had to decide how to respond to the law. So that affected individuals and it affected corporations uh, quite a bit and passed through businesses as well. But because we haven't seen tax returns from 2017 or 2018, uncertainty remains for us about how people actually did respond to the changes and how their choices impacted state um, tax revenues. So state law didn't change, but some of the things that um, taxpayers might have done in response to the federal law uh, might have had an impact at the state level, and um, some of those uh, estimates of those impacts are in this forecast. So that remains uncertain. And then finally, with 30 months before the end of 20 and 21, we have not yet seen any of the total revenues we forecast for this biennium. So um, even small changes in assumed growth rates in particularly volatile income sources, as we've already talked about capital gains, for instance, and corporate profits, could materially alter the budget picture into our planning horizon. So I'll now turn it over to Budget Director Britta Rayton. Okay, unless before we, we have get questions. to that, I've got a couple of members though with uh, questions. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, first of all, my question is for Mr. Marks. Mr. Marks, I know that there's a report that comes out. I don't know when it shows the expenditures of the budget that are growing rapidly. Do you, does that come out on an annual basis, a biennial basis? It was part of the box of things that a younger Pat Garofalo received from Chairman Knobloch back in 2006. He just gave me a box of things to read. And I suspect a box is going to be showing up in my office sometime between here and the end of the year. What, uh, do you know which report I'm talking about? Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Represent, Garofalo. Uh, Mr. Marks. The, the fastest growing expenditures report or something like that. I yeah. believe it's a January 15th due date, and I believe it did, would be January 15th, 2019 would be the next one. Or is <laughs> we'll have to check. All right. Good well, Representative Garofalo, you asked for that box last time. I, yeah. I, I did bring a bunch of boxes home. If you want another box, I can probably get one for you. <laughs> oh, that, that's okay. Um, second thing is for, um, for uh, our staff, uh, is one of the reasons why projected growth in Minnesota is now expected to go down because um, is one of the reasons why, because Minnesota elected the DFL to control the Minnesota House. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm joking. Sorry. Um, um, <laughs> at least you thought it was funny, Commissioner. Yeah, I thought that was good. Um, uh, with regard, in a serious note, though, and I'm paraphrasing the comments that are in the budget forecast, you talk about, um, you know, the impact of interest rates, and you kind of, you guys don't say this, but I read between the lines of interest rates likely to rise, um, tightening of monetary policy. And I wonder if you could maybe elaborate on another factor, and that would be that you know the federal government's got a huge deficit. I mean, it's, and especially for an economy that's growing. And with that level of deficit spending, they are going to be crowding out private sector investment. They're going to be taking money out of um, out of the private sector economy, which can be 
um, inflationary. Um, I did not read the entire report, but I read about two-thirds of it last night, and I didn't see any references to that. Is there a reference to it in there? And secondly, is, are, are my concerns justified? Dr. Kolumbakitis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, representative members of the committee. So um, in the U.S. macro forecast, so I'm, gonna, I'm addressing your question about uh, U.S. deficit and debt. Um, in the macro forecast, IHS assumes that um, you know, that the deficit is, is increasing, that it has been increasing, and that the uh, federal tax cuts were deficit financed, so that increased the deficit as well. And they, when they go out into later years, they are assuming that the debt to GDP ratio does indeed increase. And so when I showed you the chart that had the 3.1% growth for the 20 years, average 20 years prior to the Great Recession and then lower growth expected going forward, a couple of the reasons for that, one is demographic generally because um, as the, the baby boom ages out of the workforce, that slows labor force growth and it slows the ability of the U.S. to grow. But another is that eventually the debt to GDP ratio at the U.S. level becomes burdensome enough that that in itself does slow the slow growth. So um, I don't think I wrote about that because it I was focusing on the things mostly that had changed since the last forecast and that's not something that had changed. That's something that's been in their long-term forecast for a long time. Uh, Representative Graffalo. Yeah, Mr. Chairman and so would you is it fair to say though that if the federal <laughs> government continues this level of deficit spending that this will crowd out private sector investment and it will drive up interest rates uh, as compared to an environment where there was smaller deficit spending? Dr. Kolumbakitis. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Garofalo, members of the committee. So the level of deficit spending that we see now is baked into the cake here. So this level of, of deficit spending by the federal government and the debt of the federal government is incorporated into the forecast that we see here. And so that's, that's, al that's already part of this story. Um, would, it, it depends on if the, if the federal government were to lower the deficit, um, that, would that in and of itself be, could that be stimulative for the U.S. economy? It depends on how they do it. So because the, because the federal government can deficit spend, the federal government is able to do things like cut taxes and try to do stimulus that way and pay for it with a deficit without much impact without much negative impact in the short term. And the impact comes in the long term. So, um, so it's hard, it, it depends on what they, how they do it, um, what's done with, what other things are done with spending and how, uh, for how long. Yeah. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, um, last uh, question. Representative Gruffalo. My last question is um, on page 24 of the report, um, and this is the extended one, <laughs> there's a notation here that, um, and I apologize, it's a couple sentences, but I'm just going to read it so that, I mean, obviously you know what's in there, but members of the committee know it. It says, we expect Minnesota wage growth of 5.5 and 4.9 percent for Minnesota in 2018 and 2019, after which Minnesota wage growth is then forecast to grow more slowly than U.S. wage income through 2023. Mm -hmm. Combined with our employment growth forecast, these rates result in growth of wage income per worker of around 3.8 percent per year. Mm -hmm. This exceeds forecasted rates of inflation over the same period, implying improvement in real wages. Yeah. I want to focus on the portion of the line that says that our income growth is going to be slower than the U.S. through 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, in light of the fact that um, Minneapolis and St. Paul have both high, um, increased um, their minimum wages above the state level, and that the state of Minnesota has a minimum wage that is auto one of the few states in the country that has a, a minimum wage that's on inflation and automatically goes up, why are those factors not accounting for um, and giving us better wage growth than the rest of the nation? Dr. Kolumbakitis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Garofalo, members of the committee. So we are talking in that, in that section, we're writing about the growth in total wage and salary income. So it's as if you add up all the payrolls of all of the employers of the state of Minnesota and look at how those things grow. And we're, uh, we're writing about how we can decompose that into 
uh, growth that is because of employment growth. So you can have the total wage and salary income grow because we have more workers uh, working or because the people who are working are making more money per worker. And I think your focus was on the more the money per worker part. So I'll, I'll get to that. Um, and what so we decompose it that way so that we can see what pieces are, are growing at what rates and our employment growth. So the addition of more jobs or more people working, that gets really, really low in our forecast. It's relatively high early on. What was, what's the year where I said five and a half percent? Is that 19? 18. Um, yeah, so it's relatively high there, um, partly because we got an influx of population in 2017, and so that allowed us to boost employment growth in the near term. But as we go further out in the forecast horizon, our employment growth becomes increasingly constrained by slow labor force growth. So that's the aging of the baby boom. And that's happening, um, that's happening at the U.S. level, too. At, at the U.S. rate as well. But in our forecast, our employment growth gets a little slower than, um, than the U.S. So what we assume, because we have this moderate growth in total wage and salary income going forward, we assume that more of the growth in wage and salary income going forward is due to people making more money per worker. Um, and less of it is due to employment growth because our employment growth is being constrained by labor force growth. So we do have growth in average wages, so wages per worker. So that would be part of the effect of having a minimum wage go up. That affects wages per worker. Um, that's still growing, but because our employment growth slows down, our total is not as high as it would be if we had more people entering the labor force. Thank you. Uh, and if I can call on Mr. Marks quick, can you just give us some <clears throat> background on that report that uh, Representative Garofalo referenced? Mr. Chair, members, the report, uh, the fastest growing expenditures report, that requirement was repealed in 2013 laws, and so it is, we haven't had that report for several years now, so the, the requirement is not there anymore. <laughs> okay, um, and if I can, just one quick follow-up question, and then I'll go to Representative Baker, Davids, and Loon. You said, Rep uh, uh, Dr. Columbakitis, that uh, in the future, as the federal government deficit grows, that's a constraint on the economy. So is that, why is that a constraint? Is it a constraint because of the crowding out effect of Representative Garofalo? Is it a constraint because people lose confidence in the government being able to pay its bills? I guess as that's fed into uh, the economic report, why is it uh, retarding growth? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, I would not, I wouldn't say it's the people losing confidence in the government. I think that even with, um, you know, with some of the fiscal brinksmanship that we've seen in recent years, people still assume that the federal government is going to pay its bills. Um, and the U.S. U.S. debt still remains to be seen, see, continues to be seen as, rel, as risk, riskless or risk-free, that the Fed, feds are going to pay their bills. It's, it is more because, um, because the federal government ends up spending so much more of its budget on paying off debt that there's less room for the government to spend money on things that could stimulate the economy or could contribute to economic growth. And so one of the, you know, the things that contribute to economic growth are consumer spending, business spending, um, and government spending. And when the government is mostly just paying off debt, uh, then uh, we don't have much room for the government to, uh, to provide stimulus to the economy. All right. Thank you. Representative Baker. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, this is to Dr. Klamakitis. On the forecast risks that we see coming ahead, my concern would be sort of how how protected are we here in Minnesota to the next sort of hard bounce recession of remaining Minnesotans and how we would kind of bounce out of the next recession whenever that's going to be. Um, I know that uh, as a small business guy before I was certainly sitting here in St. Paul, I, I was pretty scared because a lot of my customers were were seeing their IRAs or their 401s drying up and they were leaving the state because the tax change laws changed in 2013. And we have, as you said earlier, we have more wealth really in, in Minnesota's with some of the, maybe the upper level. 
but we have probably less of them. My question to you is how robust do you think we're gonna be at that next point with the Minnesotans remaining and how will we kind of rebound from that as we kind of see that, that looming someday? Uh, how robust is Minnesota gonna be when it comes to the number of residents left to help with that income tax uh, forecast uh, models that you're seeing? Dr. Klumpakitis. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, Minnesota sees net increases in population and net increases in um, net in migration and has for as long as I've been looking at this. Uh, what, and so the, you know, we, can, we continue to grow our population, we continue to grow businesses, we continue to grow income and wealth. Um, and as I said, we, uh, not only have we had net increases in net in migration, because in the past that's been the case because of international in-migration, that we have on net lost people to other states, but, but net international in-migration has made up for that. But starting in 2017, we saw that change so that our net domestic in-migration is positive as well. And so that's just one data point, but it is a bright point in terms of um, this tight labor market and potentially bringing more workers in. So how well positioned are we uh, it depends very much on what triggers the next recession. So different things can trigger a recession. And if a recession um, happens at the national level because of softness in an industry that is less important to Minnesota, then Minnesota might not, might not be buffeted too badly by it. But if it happens because of an industry that is important to Minnesota, then we may, um, we may have a harder time. But one thing that definitely serves us well in this regard is that Minnesota has an economy that is about as diverse as the nation's. And so if you look at the distribution of employment across major industry sectors, Minnesota's distribution looks a lot like the U.S. distribution. That means that we aren't particularly dependent on any single volatile industry. And so we do tend to be resilient through downturns because when one industry is contracting another and releasing workers, another industry might be able to pick them up. So, you know, if you were going to try to set up a state to, um, to be able to withstand a downturn, you would build an economy that looks something like Minnesota's and you would build a budget reserve that looks like uh, Minnesota's budget reserve. Representative Baker. Mr. Chair, and I think just a, what I'm trying to maybe get to is and I think it's great, and I, I've noticed that we, we, we certainly see a, an influx in residents. We have more of them, but it's the type of residents we have still. So what I've learned talking with a lot of accountants back in my district was if we lost five successful Minnesotans to leaving the state, they, maybe they were employers, maybe they were investing in different things. And this was, you know, uh, before the recession, after the recession, um, when the laws were changing, my concern is that the folks that are here that have that wealth, let's just call it the, maybe the 250 to 500,000 income uh, and above, are there less of them? I know our, our population is rising, mm -hmm. but when we lost one or two or three of the wealthier Minnesotans that were in my district, it takes 100 of, of folks like me to replace, from an income standpoint, folks like that. My, my question is sort of, have we lost that, have we, have we lost anything to be worried about mm -hmm. in that category so that we won't be able to rebound as much? Because again, replacing 100 to one or 1,000 to one because of income changes are what I'm trying to kind of get down to is what's it gonna to take to replace that, those, those few Minnesotans that might have left? Dr. Columba, uh, Mr. Chairman, representative members of the committee. So, the forecast that I've presented to you that shows Minnesota continuing to add jobs through this long expansion and Minnesotans continuing to be employed and the income tax growing and the corporate tax growing and our being able to add to the budget reserve, all of those things have taken place with the people that we have and with the people that we have had. And so the story going forward should look a lot like the story we have up to this point, that we will continue to grow, and that's what the forecast is, that the state, state income tax revenues are going to continue to grow, and that um, the economy is going to continue to grow. Um, in terms of, are, do we have fewer 
high income people than we used to. It's my understanding, although I haven't looked at these data in a while, that if you look at um, the Department of Revenue produces statistics on taxpayers by um, by rate class, I think, or by income class, and that we the the people the numbers of people in the top income groups is growing. And so maybe some people are leaving, some people are coming in, some people are, are growing their incomes into that category, um, but it's not a number, a number of people who are declining. Thank you. Representative Davids. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to Dr. Klumakitis. Uh, two points, one is uh, we were told over and over again in tax committee that if we had tax cuts, it would create a structural budget deficit. I don't see where that happened. Do you? Dr. Kolumbakitis. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, we do not have a structural budget deficit at the moment, and this is a current law forecast, so all of the tax laws that have been passed up to this point are embedded here. Okay, and Mr. Chairman, Dr. Kolumbakitis, we were told uh, on June 26th of 2017 that as far as tax cuts, as to the tax cuts, that, well, this is Commissioner Bowerly, I'm quoting, uh, Commissioner Bowerly said that the state stands to lose an estimated $5 billion in tax revenues in the next decade. Do you see that coming? Dr. Kolumbakitis. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, I'm not familiar with that testimony or what the context was, but I can say that, again, this is a current law forecast. Mm -hmm. So whatever law, t Minnesota's tax law is reflected in this revenue forecast. So Mr. Chairman and Doctor, you don't see where we're gonna be losing $5 billion in tax revenues. It, it's, I didn't see it as I read through this. Dr. Kolumbakitis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, again, this is the, the revenue forecast in front of you is my revenue forecast. Okay, thank you. And I don't see it in there. Representative Loon. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Colin Peters. Um, just a question about labor force participation. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we in, in Minnesota, we're higher than the national average and it sounds like that's around 70% or maybe that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering if historically, if that's kind of where we would be normally, maybe 30, 40 years ago, mm. in terms of labor force participation or if any of those numbers have changed. Because I know during the recession, we had a lot of people who just kind of stopped looking for work. Yeah. And also, um, obviously you count 16 year olds and that, is there a cutoff point where people presumed have reached <coughs> retirement age and we don't count them in that, in that uh, category anymore? Mm -hmm. Dr. Klumpkitis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Loon, members of the committee. The labor force participation rate is the share of the population 16 and over. So there is no cutoff. So if you're 80, you're counted in that numerator or in the denominator, I mean. Um, so it's the share of the population 16 and over who are either unemployed and looking for work or they're working. So naturally, as your population ages, your, even if nothing else changes, but your population ages, your labor force participation rate is going to go down. So it's not the 16 to 64 population. And one of the reasons that's interesting to look at is because it could be the case that our over 70s or over 60 people are working more and you wanna know that. Um, so our labor force participation rate currently is the highest in the nation and it's well above the US rate. So it is very high uh, relative to every other part of the, the, rest, the rest of the states of the country, but it is low relative to our own history. So it has come down and it's come down, um, a peak is, I don't know if I have the chart in front of me, I can't remember exactly when the peak was, but uh, it, has, it has been coming down, it's been coming down across the country, it's been coming down in all states. Um, and in some places, uh, that's a particular concern because of people, discouraged workers leaving the workforce. In Minnesota, if you look at our unemployment rate, our headline unemployment rate that I showed you in the chart, and you add in the discouraged workers, the people who, who have dropped out of the labor force, so meaning um, they aren't counted as unemployed because they aren't looking for work. You have to be looking for work to count as unemployed. You add those people in, it doesn't change the unemployment rate very much, meaning that that level of discouraged workers, that's at pre-recession levels. So the reason for um, our unemployment rate coming down 
in in recent in recent um, in the recent data is more because of the aging of the population and not because of workers leaving the workforce. Um, and now we because our participation our participation is so high it's kind of low it's kind of leveled out. Um, what else was I going to say about that? So if you, you're looking at, at even broader measures of unemployment than what I presented, so adding in discouraged workers, but also adding in the people who are involuntarily part-time, so they have a part-time job, but they prefer a full-time job, you add those people in, and we're, it's that those levels are still at pre-recession levels. And so measures that are of a big concern in some other states really don't show that level of slack or that deep a bench of labor pool in Minnesota. Representative Bloom. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Kalman Peters. Well, yeah, I mean, it it just seems interesting to me that as as a nation and even in Minnesota that our participation rate seems to have fallen. And obviously, some of it could be aging of the workforce. But are we, mm -hmm. um, you know, in talking to employers, there's a real problem with some um, industries and in that with finding qualified workers. So the mm -hmm. definite skills gap, and that's something we've talked about. And I'm wondering. Um, if there's a way to quantify how much of that is and how much may just be, um, you know, a percentage of population that may be chronically unemployed or, um, you know, just other factors. And, and if, if there's a way to quantify that, I'm just wondering how many, how many people out there with either skills training or some other kind of assistance would actually be able to get into the labor force mm -hmm. and help improve that, our numbers. Dr. Columbus. Uh Mr. Chairman, Representative Loon, members of the committee. Uh, again, there just aren't that many people on the bench in Minnesota. That's what the data show. Um, but to the extent that we do still have, we do still have pockets of unemployed workers, and we st still have people who are not in the labor force. And so the fact that the labor market is as tight as it is means that employers are figuring out how to be really creative in how to make matches with the people who are still getting a foot in the door. And so it's kind of a it's kind of an exciting opportunity for employers and employees to make those matches and for us to build um, pathways to labor force participation and pathways to employment for people who have otherwise faced obstacles, people with disabilities, younger people, older people, people with English as a second language, um, previously incarcerated people, people who live in a remote area where the jobs are in one place and they're in another place. And so we need to make a match with regard to transportation, thinking differently about skills and qualifications. So um, it is, it, this tight labor market means there's room for a lot of imagination and creativity in, uh, in um, helping us continue to thrive. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one last question I guess I've got for you, Dr. Columbus. <clears throat> Just going back to your earlier comments, your first point on the trade policy uncertainty, I think you said mm -hmm. something to the effect that this forecast took into account policies that were in place as of the date of the forecast. So the Trump administration has a, let's call it a modest tariff going right now with China, mm -hmm. but as of January 1st, they're going to significantly increase those tariffs. I guess those have been moved back 90 days now. When the forecast talks about that which is in effect, is something in effect if it's already announced, such as the January 1st uh, tariff increase, or are we only talking about this forecast having the tariffs that, the 10% of tariffs, I think, that were actually in place in November when this was put together? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, at the time of the November forecast, IHS assumed that the increase in the tariff rates to, on Chinese imports, the, the increase that's scheduled for January up to 25%, they assumed that that was going to happen. Oh, okay. And so that, it, it wasn't just that, you know, the tariffs that actually had been you know, put into practice, but it was ones that the ones that were on the books to be planned. And so they assumed that that was going to happen. Okay, so then if there was some sort of a agreement where those didn't take place, that would uh, boost the growth in the forecast. So Mr. Chairman, um, what they did in their last forecast is that they estimated the impact on GDP growth of the full 
portfolio of tariffs that had been put in place. And they said that that full portfolio of tariffs would um, lower real GDP growth by about a tenth of a percent, so 0 0.1 percentage points per year through 2023, I believe. So that was the full, th the full thing. The, the increase from on Chinese imports from 10% to 25%, if that didn't happen because of the, you know, the, the agreement that, um, that we think may be in place at this point, that would be some small fraction of that 0.1 percentage point. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I don't see any other questions for Dr. Columbakitis. Uh, so uh, thank you, Doctor. Yeah, great. Um, Budget Director Ratan. Thank you. Um, Again, Britta Rayton, State Budget Director. So moving to the next slide, uh, we'll look at the expenditure side of the budget. Expenditures are down relative to forecast in both biennia, in both fiscal year 18, 19, and in FY20 and 21. E12 education expenditures are virtually unchanged from end of session estimates. Um, the change in both biennia is less than 0.1%. Property tax aids and credits have increased relative to end of session estimates by 11 million in FY18-19 and 64 million in fiscal years 20 and 21. This is largely due to growth in property tax refunds from homeowners. I'm going to skip past the health and human services line for just a moment. This is the largest driver of change, but there's some more context for this on the next slide, so we'll come back to it. Moving to debt service, estimated spending on debt service is down by 26 million in fiscal years 18 and 19 due to a smaller bond sale than we originally anticipated and the fact that we received lower rates on those bonds. In fiscal years 20 and 21, the estimated expenditures are increasing by 18 million and this is uh, pretty much for the inverse reasons. We expect to have a larger bond sale next summer due to the delay of some bonds that we had expected to sell this summer being sold next summer. And we're assuming that there will be some rate increases next year. The all other category changes by 74 million in fiscal years 18 and 19. The largest driver of this change is $90 million in lower spending in the healthcare premium subsidy program. And this is the funding that I mentioned moved to the reserve. In fiscal years 20 and 21, the all other line declines by $40 million. 26 million of that reduction is in the area of corrections and that's due to a lower prison population forecast. So moving back up to the health and human services line, expenditure estimates are down 216 million in fiscal years 18 and 19 relative to end of session. And this is due to lower enrollment across programs and additional federal revenue for chemical dependency treatment. In fiscal years 20 and 21, total estimated expenditures declined by 517 million and approximately 383 million of that or 75% of the change is in medical assistance. So the next slide will provide um, some more information about the change in medical assistance. On this slide, the top line is the estimate for medical medical assistance spending as of the end of session and the bottom line is the estimate for medical assistance in this forecast. The largest component of change within medical assistance is lower than expected growth in managed care rates. And the blue portion of the space between the lines represents the savings due to those managed care rates. Rates for calendar year 2019 grew less than anticipated. And those rates are based on the actual experience of calendar year 2017, which was lower than expected. And that's the last full year we have experience for. And this uh, lower rate estimate carries through and reduces um, the rates through the forecast period. The reduced growth rates are likely due to the health plan's efforts to respond um, to the competitive bidding process for calendar year 2016. There are other changes in medical assistance represented by the dotted section above the blue on the chart and the biggest drivers of the additional change include lower enrollment in MA and additional federal funding for chemical dependency treatment. Dr. Rattan, can I ask you, um, Every single year, I think, since I've uh, come back in the last four years, 
The one constant has always been that health and human service expenditures come in substantially under the forecast. And I'm, I certainly would rather they come in under the forecast than over the forecast. And I know this is a really big budget area, but is there some reason that we're always uh, under the forecast? I mean, is there a way to maybe forecast this particular area a little bit better? You know, I look at uh, Representative Hamilton and Representative Garofalo, and I know Representative Fabian is here, but we've got committees whose entire general fund budget is uh, less than the amount of uh, what the Health and Human Service expenditures come in under uh, in terms of the difference every single year. And I know it's a big budget. I know it's a very, very complicated area, but it seems like this is the one area that's consistently coming in low. And I'm glad, again, it's coming in low, but is there something we could do to be more accurate here? Uh, Mr. Chair, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think it's a particularly difficult portion of the budget to forecast, given that we need to forecast both program enrollment and cost of care. And um, those elements are are more difficult than say um, K-12 expenditures, which are based on the number of K-12 pupils that show up in a flat amount um, for the most part in the basic funding per pupil. So it, it is just a very complex area of the budget and it's often not until we see actual experience that we're, we're able to kind of uh, narrow in on, on the expenditures. Okay, but it's always coming in low. I could understand that if it was sometimes high, sometimes low, it's a complicated area, but it's always low. So I, do you feel people are just being extra conservative in their forecasting so they don't get a bad surprise? Is that kind of what's happening? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would have to talk more with our Health and Human Services analysts to get you a, a better answer to, to that question. Okay, Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Rayton. I was going to ask you kind of the same thing as uh, uh, the chair on that. In the times that I've been here, it, it, it we've always been um, shot low. And, um, and you can kind of see that while you think you want to be conservative so that you don't come up short. You make sure you have, can cover everybody. And when the economy gets worse, more people qualify for government stuff, more people go on Medicaid, more people go on Minnesota Care. So when the economy goes down, more people need that stuff. So it makes sense that you're trying to get out ahead of it. But it just in the worst year I was ever here for budget was um, uh, going into 11. And uh, we, were, we were over a billion. So our budget, we had to cut $6 billion in the budget and to pass an 11 uh, with a shutdown. And our HHS number was almost a billion dollars off. Uh, so that that was a billion dollars that we could have spent in higher ed that never got spent and we never kind of caught up on. Uh, so I can understand being conservative and I can understand that, but we do have the same number of families. We know who they are. We know where they are. We know what the revenue looks like. And it does seem like we are uh, continuously, whether times are good or times are bad, uh, overshooting that. And, you know, Representative Hamilton uh, actually spent more money in my committee than he did in his committee. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it, it, it of Dean only because his target was so low. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it uh, it it does matter to a lot of other uh, a lot of other budget areas around the state that we dial that in and close and and also within the HHS target that we're spending money on things uh, like mental health and other things that we can't because it's just automatically written to uh, entitlement headcount. Uh, so I, I don't know how we get a handle on that, but um, I do think that, uh, that uh, Jim is right about the need to dial that in. And Director Rattan, we're not picking on you. You're new, so we thought it was a particularly <laughs> good time to uh, bring it up since it's been a 
kind of a historical issue. Representative Carlson. Yeah, I was just going to say it's been a few years since I was on the uh, uh, Education Division of Appropriations, but we had a period of time where year after year we had the same issue, much lower number with financial aid mm -hmm. because it was so difficult for uh, the uh, what we called back then the uh, Higher Education Services Office, I think the name has changed slightly, to predict what the student behavior was going to be. And so year after year, we would have a savings. Um, and sometimes as a percentage of financial aid, it was quite significant. Um, but I was going to ask if you could review, I'm, with the discussion, I'm taking a look here. It's a savings due to lower managed care rates. Mm -hmm. Could you explain what that footnote uh, on the chart actually means. And Director Atan. We talked about lower managed care <coughs> rates and how that may have impacted on that uh, total of what was it, 216 million, I think? Yeah, 216. So the. Uh, what actually happened there? Yeah, Representative Carlson, it was lower, lower rates paid to managed care organizations in calendar year 19. So the rates that have been set for 19 for managed care organizations are lower than what were previously anticipated. And then that carries through um, as we project future rates. And so the, the lower um, assumed rates for managed care organizations contributes to 245 million in change in this forecast. Uh, Representative Carlson. And Mr. Chair, maybe I'm not clear on the question and what yeah. what generated that or how did that come about is my, my question. I understand that the rates were lower than projected, mm -hmm. but there must have been something with contracting or something that took place that meant lower rates. Director Rattan. Uh, Representative Carlson, that's that's correct. So the, the rates that were, were were set with managed care organizations are lower because the actual experience of costs in 2017 were lower than anticipated. And so the assumption is based on due to competitive bidding, at least in part, that managed care organizations are taking steps to control their costs in order to meet the rates um, that they bid. And so, Mr. Chairman, it would not have been hard for us to predict that going in yeah. what, as to what those lower rates would be. I, my point is it's a big number, and I think we all understand that, but I think it's important, too, to understand the why, why that happened at least this particular time. And I know you've raised the question about the history, but um, maybe that uh, gives us some context to put it in at least this time. Okay, please continue, Director Rayton. Thank you. Uh, moving to the next slide, uh, this returns us to a view of total revenues and expenditures in the general fund. And this slide gives the first look at the planning estimates for fiscal year 22 and 23. And this chart shows the structural balance between revenues and expenditures in fiscal years 2021 and in 22 and 23. What that means is that it removes from the, ch the chart the impact of balance forwards and the impact of contributions to the reserves. You can see in this chart that the structural balance declines into the planning years, that's 22 and 23. Um, so revenues in those years are only exceeding expenditures by 456 million. And this is before we've, we've set a budget for those years. So the expenditure growth is just on the forecast programs within the budget. I also want to highlight that this is representing the structural balance in the general fund. Not included in this total is the projected deficit in the health care access fund. With the expiration of the provider tax, the health care access fund is forecast to have a $969 million deficit in fiscal years 22 and 23. That fund pays for a number of state programs, including about 6% of medical assistance, the rest of which is funded out of the general fund. In this forecast, those expenditures remain tracked in the health care access fund. So in coming legislative sessions, policymakers will need to determine whether to lower spending or to increase revenues to address the shortfall. Moving back to the overall view of the general fund, projected funding or spending, excuse me, in the general fund grows from fiscal years 2021 to 2223 by 2.9 percent annually. This is greater than the 2.5% annual growth assumed on the revenue side. 
and that's the slower growth that Dr. Columbakitas talked about earlier. The biennial growth and expenditure shown here is just, as I mentioned before, the growth that is occurring in forecast programs. The biggest driver of that growth is in medical assistance. And as you know, inflation is generally not included in expenditure estimates in the forecast, except in a limited number of programs where there is an inflation component included within the formula. Examples of that would be property tax refunds, special education within education, and a portion of uh, health care spending and debt service payments. So there's an estimate of inflation included on the slide, um, and that estimate is calculated using CPI, and it's just applied against those expenditures where inflation is not already included. And that's just to give a sense of the cost pressures going into 2021 and into 2223. And the reason the 2223 number gets so much larger is that it's compounded. So we compound the 2021 inflation and add that into the 2223. Uh, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, Dr. Rayton. No one's ever promoted me to doctor since I've been here for four years. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> Um, but Dr. the uh, France, let me <laughs> say that <laughs> thank you. before I go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention as uh, Director Raton finished up is that as you see the, the structural balance in 20 and 21 and then 22 and 23, obviously the inflation is a challenge there for in terms of what the actual balance is, but also you see the declining resources. We have more resources available in 20 and 21 than we do in the tail years as we call them in 22 and 23, which is another budget challenge. And then all the risks that Dr. Klumbakitis talked about are, are with this forecast as well. So, uh, I mean, the good news is that we have resources. The, the challenges is that we have difficult choices to make as policymakers. And I just wanted to end on that and we're happy to take more questions. Okay, other questions? Oh, um, Representative Hurtos? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I realize that you folks are mostly the messenger and uh, tell us what the numbers are and what your forecasts are. <clears throat> but I have a kind of a comment and a question in, in a more macro way. Um, we just came off the heels of a really big lesson in our economy with the Great Recession. And although we have a diverse economy in Minnesota, uh, as aggregated into, as I understand it, basically six major sectors. Uh, I had personal experience in being a home builder for more than 30 years that the construction and the housing building industry uh, represents, and its related activities, represents about 16 to 18 percent of state revenues, is what I've been led to believe. And you can validate if that's correct or not. but. At the time we slid into the Great Recession, we had a biennial budget of about $34 billion. And 16 to 18% of that is about that five and a half, six $6 billion number that there was suddenly a crash in revenue. What was unique about this particular sector is it was not just a uniform decline in revenue of all sectors, but this one just crashed completely to the extent that people who were building 40 or 50 houses a year didn't build a single house. There was a race to the bottom. And unlike people who own a soybean field, and I own one too. Um, I own more than one. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, well, actually I do too. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the, point, the point is, is that about, in, in Minnesota there was about 70% prior to the recession, 70% of Minnesotans owned a home. So everybody had skin in the game with this particular sector. And they lost a lot of equity. They had home equity lines. The values crashed so bad that that exacerbated a problem where they couldn't even sell a home. And if they did want to sell a home, they would have to come to the table with a check. So that took all the people who were in the move up market or willing to make a lateral move, took them out of the market. And so understanding where so many people have wealth in their home and for the average retiree, 60% of their net worth is in the equity in their home. So my question to you is in, in a macro way and you're not policy people, but 
Is there something we should be looking at in terms of insulating this particular industry with regard to our tax policy and uh, making it beneficial to be a homeowner and to retain ownership and to be somewhat uh, protected in the future from this type of crash because it, uh, it's been long and it's been hard and it's been a, you know, one thing about it though is the, nothing is more effective than the market. The market did more to create affordable housing than any government program or policy <laughs> that was uh, ever contrived. But um, I guess, do you have any comments about this particular recession and, and that one industry that just really crashed because you lost income to realtors, to builders, to mortgage originators, mortgage bankers, all the sales tax revenue from every stick and board that went into a house. It was very comprehensive in where it just really caused a, a massive decline and it really had less to do with, with uh, who was in charge. I mean, there's nothing that policymakers could have done to stop what was happening, so it wasn't really pointing the finger at who created a $6 billion deficit. It's just something that happened. Do you have any suggestions that we should be doing as a legislature to really shore up that industry and make sure that never happens again? Dr. Kalamakitis. Um, Mr. Chairman, Representative, members of the committee, so you bring up a, an interesting point, and this is the kind of thing I meant when I said it depend, how Minnesota will fare in the next recession depends on what triggers the next recession and what industry is most affected. So the previous recession was indeed, did indeed have an outsized impact on, constru on the construction industry. And so you're, as you describe it, yes, indeed, it did, it did that. And in states where construction is an even bigger part of the economy, like fast growing states in the Southwest, they hit even harder than Minnesota because their economies were less diverse than ours. And so that diversity does help us even in a recession that hits um, construction as much as it does. Um, and I also agree with your point that there's nothing better, there's no better tonic for the construction industry than a growing economy and growing incomes um, because construction has added jobs um, at an outpaced rate during this um, recovery and expansion period. In fact, in the last 12 months, construction is the sector that has added the greatest number of jobs and grown with the highest percentage. And so what are, um, what are some of the threats to that industry at this time? Uh, there are th there are restriction or um, limitations in in this industry with regard to available lots, um, with regard to the price of uh, um, materials, um, and with regard to the price of labor and the availability of labor. And so the the labor story is the one where you know I think. The industry is already working really hard, as I said, being creative and figuring out where are those pockets of workers who we could potentially hire. I think that the industry could be growing faster if we had faster labor force growth in Minnesota and if there were more people available to do the work. And so that's true for across all of the trades. And so the, the trade unions, for instance, that are working hard to draw people into those trades, um, is there a way that we can, um, that we can support the workers who want to do that work and to uh, to elevate elevate that work. You know, every one of the industries that is labor intensive, construction being one of them, but healthcare being another, um, every one of those industries is having to be creative about looking for looking for workers. And so, making sure that Minnesota's the workforce that we have is well trained, is healthy, has good housing. You know, is re that people graduating from our schools are ready to work or to continue on, um, continuing to make Minnesota um, a place where people from around the country and around the world are looking for a place to live. Um, make Minnesota a destination of choice, is a place where people want to live, work, and do business. All of those things can um, can help that important industry. Thank you. Um, Director Aton, just I wanted to ask a couple of other questions that uh, I just think uh, as we look at issues that are going to be big issues coming forward, I think everyone should uh, know the answers to. First of all, you talked about the uh, health care access fund and the provider tax. Mm -hmm. So as I recall, the provider tax is ending at the end of 2019, correct? December 31st, 2019? Mr. Chair, that's correct. 
Uh, but I understand that there is there are significant revenues that will come in in calendar year 2020 as a result of just sort of the billing cycle of uh, clinics uh, bill, uh, insurance companies need to pay, the taxes collect, it gets to the state. So we still will have significant monies coming in in 2020, correct? Mr. Chair, yes. Um, as, as an example, in fiscal year 19, the provider tax is estimated to bring in $684 million. In fiscal year 20, it, it's estimated to bring in $472 million. Okay, and as I understand, the health care access fund right now is projected to have a surplus in the next biennium, 2021, but then would have a substantial deficit in 22 23 uh, under current law. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, in, yes, in, uh, by the end of fiscal year 2021, there um, is estimated to be $48 million remaining in the fund. And then by the end of 2022-23, uh, the deficit is the $969 million that I referenced earlier. And that is because we are taking money out of it or under current law have been taking money out of it to pay for medical assistance uh, primarily. Ms. Mr. Chair, yes, there is a portion of medical assistance spending that is directed at the health care access fund. So that is currently carried forward as a base assumption for the fund that okay. that spending continues. Okay, and then one other question. As I look at the, uh, the last slide you had that showed the long-term budget outlook uh, weakening the structural balance of $456 million for 2022-23. Now, the last few biennia, we've uh, had a I think a 2%, 2% increase in general fund uh, formula uh, for education. So if we did a two and two in 2021, how much would that cost in 22-23, roughly? Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I know in 22-23, if, um, if we had funded two and two in 20 and 21, it would be over $500 million in 22-23. Well, I think just uh, people as they go into the next budget uh, uh, should bear this in mind because uh, we have really a lot of money, uh, relatively speaking, in this budget for one-time spending, but uh, not a lot, uh, at least in this forecast. Of course, we'll have another forecast in February, but not so much in this forecast for ongoing spending for 22-23. Uh, Representative Houseman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up on that, the... the when this decision was made, um, did anyone project it out to anticipate that $969 million and it, was there a plan for how we were going to deal with yeah. that in the future? Yeah, man. Oh. Um, Director Aton. At, at, in 20, I was trying to remember the year, thank you. In 2011, when, it was, when that decision was made, um, I don't believe projections were made out that far. Um, and it, since that time, more medical assistance spending has moved into the health care access fund. So uh, that also exacerbates the size of the deficit in 22-23. Yeah, Representative Houseman, I think, you know, two big things that have happened since is one, uh, this used to be the primary funding source for Minnesota care, and then we ended up getting really a lot of money from the federal government to effectively fund Minnesota care. Uh, and so in one sense, yeah, I don't know the date when that all happened. Representative Dean might know when the federal government essentially took over funding Minnesota care. And so there certainly could have been a feeling that we didn't need the tax anymore since it was really created to fund Minnesota care and now the federal government was paying for it. But then we did start using this fund to pay for medical assistance. and. That has been a huge, as people on this committee know, uh, part of our uh, budget uh, and a growing big part of our budget uh, every single year. Uh, Representative Dean, if I can put you on the spot, do you recall when that happened? Mm -hmm. The government started funding a lot of the money for Minnesota Care? Uh, in 2011, as Governor Dayton's first act, he expanded Medicaid expansion into Minnesota. Uh, that immediately started that off. Uh, Governor Pawlenty, uh left it as a jump ball for the next uh, winner of that election. Governor Dayton won. He elected to do that. Uh, and with the expansion of 
Medicaid into the state of Minnesota, the people that are currently covered under Medicaid were up to that point uh, people in Minnesota care. So uh, what the federal government was saying was, uh, Minnesota, you did a great job, patted us on the head, said step aside, we will take care of these folks. And that left us wondering what we were going to do with the proceeds for uh, the 2% sick tax, which we found lots of things to spend money on outside of that uh, over time. And uh, it's a good question for people moving forward of uh, how we're gonna do that. Currently, Minnesota care can be funded without the 2% sick tax. Uh, moving forward, yeah, but didn't uh, wasn't it underneath Obamacare that we started getting a lot of the money to fund Minnesota Care? So it would have been, I don't know, by 2011. There was money in the era funds for expansion and also increased rates and lots of other things within um, uh, within HHS targets that picked that up. But the biggest factor was expansion of who was covered under Medicaid. Okay, um, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and just to kind of add to that, so um, um, I think part of the rationale, at least initially, for taking some of the Medicaid money out of the Healthcare Access Fund was exactly what Representative Dean just explained, that the, the um, because of the expansion of Medicaid, it picked up many of those individuals who were on the, um, Minnesota Care program, which was largely state funded at that point. And so it was felt to be kind of fair to pay for some of those people out of that same fund. It was, I think, felt to be some of the same individuals. And then I'm not sure of the exact date of when the, the uh, Minnesota Care, now called a basic health plan, right, under the Affordable Care Act, when that funding really started to come from, from the feds, but the deal was that the, um, those people who were on it would otherwise have received premium tax credits through Minsher because they had low enough incomes that the feds would have been providing some of the funding for their insurance. And that because we have this special program for them that the feds would then pass that through to us and that's what funds this, um, this fund that um, I'm trying to think of what we, and it's not just the healthcare access fund, there's a special fund for, for those monies that come in for the basic health plan. So that's kind of the history of it, although I don't remember the year either exactly how that phased in. Well, I just wanted to bring that issue up because I know it's an issue that's going to get a lot of discussion, or at least I suspect it's an issue that's gonna get a lot of discussion in the next legislature. Are there any other questions for our uh, guests? Uh, Director Aton, uh, Commissioner Franz, Dr. Colin Bikidis. Uh Well, thank you very much, and it has been a pleasure to work with you uh, these past years. And uh, you, welcome, Dr. Aton, and your new position. <laughs> I love that I'm a doctor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, I have one uh, final uh, handout I'd like to uh, have you take a look at. You should have a handout like this that uh, Mr. Marks has prepared that has got six boxes on it. And I, I had him do this because uh, this is uh, my last meeting, as you know, and I had a last meeting like this 12 years ago, rather interestingly. And um, I was, as you know, the Ways and Means Chair way back in 2003 to 2006. And I still recall in this room uh, chairing the forecast hearing for the 2006 November forecast as my last uh, meeting uh, chairing the Ways and Means Committee. At least I thought it was the last meeting I'd ever chair the Ways and Means Committee meeting. Then I uh, was uh, uh, elected by my uh, constituents again, for which I'm very grateful and grateful to the speaker for again appointing me. But I wanted to uh, point this out of just how quickly things can change around here in the numbers because, you know, in November 2006, there might have been a few uh, glimmers of issues on the horizon of the Great Recession, but I really don't think too much at that point. It was probably more like a year later in 2007. And, you know, things are still going well with the economy, but there are, uh, some people would say, a few uh, issues out there to be concerned about too. And so I want to direct you to these boxes, if I can, just quickly as we wrap up the meeting. If you look to the 
very top box, you can see the November 2006 forecast as we looked to what was then the upcoming biennium of 2008 to 2009, we projected revenue of 33.5 billion, we projected spending of 32.5 billion, and if you looked at the carry forward from 06 to 07 and what we were projecting to have in 08 to 09, we had pretty close to right around a $2 billion surplus uh, at that time. And one year later, um, things had changed quite a bit. Uh, revenue was down 500 million, uh, but uh, spending was up 2.2 billion. Now there had been some changes at that point. I guess one of the changes is the change that's happening now as we went from having a Republican House to a uh, Democrat House, but we did have a Republican governor at that point, and now of course we have had a Democrat governor, still will have a Democrat governor. Uh, but spending, obviously, there was new spending passed in the 2007 legislature, and one year later we had a you know, $1.6 billion deficit, at least if you looked at that year or that projection of the uh, income for that biennium minus the spending for that biennium. You looked at the November 2008 forecast and the projected revenue had gone down another 500 million. Uh, spending was about the same, but now we were at a $2.2 billion deficit for that biennium just two years later. And if you look at the out year, you can see how really striking it was. We went from having, in 2000, back in the November 2006 forecast, as we looked out to the out years of 2010 and 11, we went from having a $3.2 billion surplus <clears throat> to one year later having uh, a $200 million deficit to two years later having an almost $5 billion deficit. And uh, some of this was increased spending. Most of it was the economy going south, going into the Great Recession. But uh, as uh, many of you here will uh, be on this committee again, uh, perhaps uh, all of you again will be on this committee again, well, except for a few of us, uh, <laughs> a few of us. Um, I think it uh, bears in mind to keep this history in mind of how quickly things can change. And, uh, you know, we don't, we have quite a bit of money for this biennium that we could do one-time things with. We could carry it over if we want to and then do somewhat more for the next biennium, but uh, things can change very, very quickly, even in a year. And so as we look to an economy where we do see a few storm clouds perhaps on the horizon, I just wanted to bring up this history so people have it in mind. And uh, I guess, does anyone have any questions on this? Uh, it was prepared by, by Mr. Marks. Uh, Representative Hurthouse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was not here when you uh, were chair in the uh, 12 years ago and the previous, but my recollection as a taxpayer, we didn't have a budget reserve account back then. Is that correct? I think that was established uh, some years later and uh, we did have a budget reserve then too. Okay. Yes. I didn't have the two billion dollars it has isn't it now but and I don't recall what it had but we 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 did have a reserve account, yeah. but it wasn't as structured as it is now I, I believe in 14 we passed legislation uh, requiring that November forecasts have to get deposited to keep that shored up and so one thing I would um, comment on here is that we might be in a much healthier circumstance um, this time with a larger budget reserve and cash Page. amount available. Page three. And I guess I would say that you know, clearly I think I mean we have more money now in our budget reserve than we've ever had and uh, it was uh, more than we had back then but as you can see the two billion seventy five million we have in the budget reserve uh, wouldn't cover all this if we uh, face something like this again. Uh, Representative Carlson, Houseman, and Wiggy. Uh, oh, Representative. Oh, I'm sorry? Who was next? Oh, I said Representative Carlson. Oh, okay. I, I thought maybe it ch L. changed your mind as to which where you were going, which would have been fine. No, I was going <laughs> to, revisiting that history, um, any budget reserve we would have had at the time was very small. But uh, two things uh, happened. I served on uh, 
before that, the Blue Ribbon Commission for the University of Minnesota. And we had a number of people uh, come in, experts on budgeting and so on, to talk about what a healthy reserve would be. And the university is one of our larger accounts, of course. And uh, the decision was made, uh, in fact, Governor, future Governor Carlson, he was the auditor at the time, uh, uh, was also on that, and we decided uh, 5%. Well, then a few years later, when we were dealing with establishing the uh, budget reserve for the state, uh, we used the same benchmark of 5% uh, budget reserve. And uh, again, there was a lot of uh, input uh, that that would be a good benchmark to, to use. And we're getting close. We haven't hit the 5% yet, although it's a bit of a moving target because as the budget increases, then the budget reserve uh, would increase as well. But uh, going back to the uh, housing, that's you know absolutely an important industry. And uh, I remember uh, the state economist calling and he wanted to meet with uh, me and Lawrence Solberg right away. And he said, uh, you know, there's a huge cloud on the horizon. And he said, it's housing. And he explained what uh, the problem uh, we were about to encounter was, and literally a day or two later picked up the newspaper and the headlines were there that uh, the housing industry had basically collapsed. And uh, he uh, told us at that initial meeting that, um, and explaining just as you did, the uh, huge impact that housing has, wood products industry, you know, that's Minnesota isn't exactly typical, you know, when you talk about housing. We have our basic housing needs, but we're a big a big provider with the wood fiber industry and and so on that goes into that. So uh, it was quite a, uh, a surprise at the time, but uh, the state economist uh, did give us a heads up because he was in the process of getting the various reports and so on, and he saw it coming. So uh, only emphasize that um, it is good to have that reserve. You know, and it's been debated, you know, whether 5% is the good number or not, but uh, it's one I think that we've probably pretty well settled in on when you folks were in charge and when, when we've been in charge that that's a good benchmark. But if we did have a collapse like that, it, it wouldn't cover all of it. That's, that's true. Representative Parkinson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I couldn't help but note uh, with all this talk about uh, potential uh, shortfalls in the future. I was just looking at the cover that the MMB has selected for uh, for their presentation and you'll note that it says Silver Creek Cliff. Perhaps that car is headed for some kind of a cliff uh, as it proceeds through the tunnel there, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, as I look at that picture, it looks like there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. <laughs> that's a printing error. <laughs> those, are headlights. those are headlights. <laughs> Representative Waginius. Oh, no, Representative Hausman. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to observe that on page three, we have the budget reserve history that goes all the way back to 2002. It looks like there was none then and there was none in 9, 10, 11, just cash flow. Well, yeah, back in 2002, 2003, Representative Hausman, at that point, uh, we were coming out of the previous recession uh, from that was kind of brought on by 9-11. Uh, remember after 9-11, uh, the economy kind of crashed then too, and we had a very significant budget shortfall. In fact, the four years I was Ways and Means Chair, and some of you were on this committee back then, we spent an awful lot of time working through what I think was a four and a half billion dollar deficit when we started at that point. And I believe we had some a budget reserve maybe going into that too. I don't quite recall anymore. But um, but in any case, I you know if you look at the law that was passed in 2013-14 that automatically adds you know one third of the surplus if there is some from the previous biennium in a forecast like the November forecast right here. I mean if you took that money and said well we hadn't added it and we added it to our uh, surplus this year, we'd have a two billion dollar surplus again. And I, I, I would have to say editorializing, I think that was a good law that was passed that uh, has that additional money going into the budget reserve. Actually back during my previous time I had worked with Representative Carlson on something similar to that that uh, repaid the school and property tax shifts. 
and that's still in law also, uh, that we kind of started off paying back those school shifts first that had been done to climb out of the recession uh, way back in 2002, 2003. And then this, I think, was a takeoff that uh, I wasn't here then, but someone added on that idea for the budget reserve. And uh, clearly there's a limit as to how big the reserve should be, but I think this has worked to help refill the reserve because otherwise, previously, there just was very little political will to, to add money to the budget reserve. Uh, Representative Carlson. Yeah, uh, when we talk about the cash flow account, that $350 million that's there now, we reached the point uh, years ago when uh, that wasn't uh, adequate. We changed uh, the payment schedules on a variety of accounts, and we did a number of things to manage the budget to get through that period because we just simply didn't have the uh, dollars there. I think we even gave uh, MMB authorization to issue certain uh, certificates of indebtedness if necessary. I don't think they ever reached that point, but they had that in their vest pocket, so to speak, because we uh, didn't have adequate uh, funds in the cash flow account. Yes. So yep. we really no, I, hit a low point, there's no question. Yeah, no, I do recall that. I don't believe they ever issued those certificates. No, but, they didn't, uh, but they were authorized they, to. Uh, they were authorized yeah. to do that. And that's, you know, we are on a cash basis and not an accrual basis as a state. And you can do some creative budgeting to move back your payment dates so that you can balance your budget uh, to a certain extent. But uh, eventually, if times are bad enough, you do run out of cash. And... Uh, that's a uh, situation you no. definitely don't want to be in. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not uh, sure I would say that was balancing the budget, but that was making sure we could pay our bills. Well, it was we, balancing was it the, from the technical yeah. legal sense. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Representative Dean, did you have a question? No, I just had a comment uh, that I think it's very obvious what happened to the economy in you, the revenue and spending information that you have on your chart it, the bottom fell out right after you left. <laughs> and it, now you're back, and here we are, and uh, we've got the best economy in my lifetime. So uh, I think that's, I think it's all due to you. And uh, I, we're both leaving Representative yes. Dean. <laughs> but uh, actually, I had a box from you as well. And uh, when, I, when I came as a freshman, I was on the bonding committee, and I, it was, uh, Representative Dorman was the was the chair at that time, and I asked him how bonding worked because I didn't know. And I thought, well, how do you how do you pay for all this stuff? Do you put a billion dollars on a credit card and just spend it? It seemed kind of weird. So I asked uh, Dorman how it worked, and he said, "Well, I don't know. Ask Knobloch." And uh, so. <laughs> I asked Jim, and uh, I asked him, you know, how does this work? You know, how do you pay for all this stuff? And and uh, he didn't really know me at the time, and he looked at me, and he was trying to figure out how smart I was, I think, and he goes, um, are you available after Ways and Means at about 3 o'clock? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, come to my office and allow about... 90 minutes because <laughs> he figured it would take him that long to talk to me about that. It'd take him 90 minutes for me to figure it out. And he did explain it to me and I think, and now I know how it works, uh, but I appreciate all you've done for me and for the committee and uh, for the state. And I hope you come back again and share ways and means again, because I think we we could use it down the road. So thanks, Mr. Chair. Well, thanks, Representative Dean. And when Representative Dean starts doing his Knobloch imitations, it's probably <laughs> time to start winding up the meeting. <laughs> but um, let me uh, just uh, say I want to thank uh, Gene Coddington, who's done just a marvelous job as our committee LA here this term. Thank you so much. I want to thank. <laughs> I want to thank Harry Kennedy, uh, our committee administrator, uh, who's. Uh, reprising his role from being the uh, CA on Ways and Means from back in 2011 and 12. And so when Craig Stone got a promotion, I was uh, pleased to get someone who already had some experience in the job, and Harry's done a great job. Absolutely. And uh, Bill Marks uh, has been with all of us uh, through thick and thin. I don't know, uh, Representative Carlson may have been here before Bill Marks was here. I'm not sure, but- I think so. Um, <laughs> But uh, Bill, we uh, you know have been so.
privileged, and I've been so privileged to work with you, uh, uh, both of the four-year stints I've had in uh, Ways and Means, both in the very difficult times we had back in the early 2000s coming out of the 2001 recession and now the last two years when we've had somewhat more money. So thank you so much for your service to this committee in our state. And finally, Mr. Sullivan, um, you have always been prepared to uh, do those amendments on the fly, and uh, we've uh, worked on a number of things. Not all the bills we worked on uh, got enacted. I still would like to see something that uh, Representative Carlson and I had both signed on to a bill that would deal with the emergency funding. If there ever was another sort of a shutdown, what uh, should be funded, uh, what shouldn't be funded. And I know I worked on Mr. Sullivan, uh, with Mr. Sullivan a lot on that. So thank you, Colby. And finally, on the staff side, our researchers, uh, Republican research, uh, Bill Glan, uh, DFL research, Dave Sullivan. Where are you, Mr. Sullivan? He left. He left. Oh, all right, he was here. Well, anyway, thank you both for all of your work as well. Uh, Representative Carlson, I uh, wish you well uh, coming into uh, the position as uh, Chair of Ways and Means, and uh, it's been my pleasure to work with you and my pleasure to work with all of you. I just, uh, you know, I consider you all my friends and I've really enjoyed chairing the committee. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, before you hit the gavel, I just want to thank you. Um, we weren't always successful or seldom with our amendments, but uh, I do have to say you always uh, gave us the courtesy and recognized us and gave us a chance to argue our uh, case and uh, I appreciated that. And I uh, wish you well, and uh, kind of like you, I'm rejoining the chairmanship. I've been there before, as I used to reference from time to time, but uh, I do want to thank you for your service. Thank you. thank you. And thank you, everyone. I wish you well in the next session. Uh, I uh, will probably stop by once in a while, although I, as I've told many people, I. Don't have the patience uh, of the lobbyists to sit in the audience and watch us here. Uh, sometimes I'm not sure uh, if I have the patience to actually be at the table here. Uh, but uh, it's been my privilege uh, to be here. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you.